Now for these, we're going to do the ventricles of the brain. Uh, you've seen them in the lab, and right now, let's just look at them as far as the orientation. These are in um, the spaces in the brain. I'm going to hold this up again so that you can see this. And as you look, this is where that location is. This would be the first and the second, the lateral ventricles. And so that's where they are. Third one is going to be where the thalamus is, connects down with that aqueduct of sylvius to the fourth ventricle, and then down from there through the uh, spinal cord. So let me just go over this with you so that you I've got this again. When you look at this right here, then this is the bone. So this is the skull right there. And so we've got that. And then the inner lining of the skull. So if you were looking at a skull, you'd see this kind of uh, wax paper kind of uh, uh, covering. That is the outer dura mater. So I've got it in blue. You can see inner dura mater is right over the, uh, the brain. And when you look at the word dura mater, maybe I'll put it in the color that it is. Matter comes from maternal, it means mother. And of course that would be protective. This one, durable, and so we get the term tough mother or tough protector. So we've got this tough covering. Now, the next one that we've got is the arachnoid matter. And arachnoid means spider web. And so you can see the X kind of webbing shape that's there. That's where the cerebral spinal fluid is. And we're going to see how does the cerebral spinal fluid get back into the bloodstream. I want you to look right now, and I'm going to put these connectors right through here. And on your diagram, you can see there the arachnoid granulations. They reabsorb the cerebral spinal fluid into the sinus. This is where they're reabsorbing it, into this uh, sinus, which is bloodstream. So we've got it right there. Uh, this for the red is the pia matter. And you can see that it's going over all of the convolutions in the brain. Pia means gentle, and so it's going over, giving the uh, blood supply as well. So we've got these coverings, but how much a CSF is made a day? Hopefully you remember, and so when you think of it, it's 500 milliliters, which is a lot of CSF. That's two cups that's going to be made a day. But where is it made? So I want you to look over here, and we've got the choroid plexus. In each of these ventricles, there's this choroid plexus that actually has fenestration. So when you look at the fenestrations, you remember them from when we did urinary with the glomeruli. These allow the filtrate to come out. And so every day, we make 500 milliliters. So two cups worth of this CSF a day. That's what it's going to make. We can't have that much in those ventricles or it would start to compress the blood vessels, compress the brain. It would even push down against the brain stem and it would be fatal. So it's got to be reabsorbed. And that's what we're seeing here. Arachnoid granulations reabsorb this CSF into the bloodstream, which this is going to be a part of. On this diagram, this is the superior sagittal sinus, and this is the inferior sagittal sinus. Here we've got a transverse sinus, and then I want you to put your hands right here, and of course, what are those veins that we've got? The jugular veins. And so it drains down and into the jugular veins. So this is coming down and in through there. We need that ability to reabsorb that. Now I want you to think for a second, what could disrupt this? So um, if you're thinking of meningitis, it's going to be an inflammation, it's a bacterial, or it can be viral, either one. But with that, then this right here, the arachnoid matter and the pia matter become swollen. 
And when they become swollen, it closes the opening that's here. And with that, this can back up and you can start to have this cause hydrocephalus, but hydrocephalus in an adult or in a, a, even a child that their skull is fused over, then it's going to put pressure on the blood vessels and on the brain. And so meningitis could do it there, but also I want you to look here. Right here at the arachnoid granulations, it can actually get white blood cells starting to block it off and it can't reabsorb the, the CSF into the bloodstream. Those then could allow this to start to enlarge and then it's going to put pressure on and it could be fatal. When we look at this one, I want you to notice that there are choroid plexus locations in each of these that we've got. Third ventricle right here, fourth ventricle here, first and second on, on here. So now we've got the ventricles, and I want you to just think of hydrocephalus, and of course, what did hydro mean? And it meant water, and cephalus mean brain. And so that was the, in a newborn, and the skull can still um, expand, then the, the skull will get enlarged because this is big. What can they do for that? They can put the shunt in. And so if they put a shunt in, they'll take it down into the peritoneal cavity and allow it to drain this CSF. And so that's what we're seeing as far as the ventricles of the brain. Now, I want to go to the next that we've got. And so I'm going to have you just turn over and we're going to look at this next part on uh, the disorders for the brain. And so, uh, when we look at that, I'm going to have you just turn your page over one more so that we've got this. Thank you, we're going to do this. Stroke and TIA. What is a stroke? What's a TIA? First of all, what is another name for a stroke? And you can see there, cerebrovascular accident. So, I'm going to just do a quick picture. Now, what's the cerebrovascular accident? I want you to look at this, and if a clot forms right there, what will happen? All of the area that was fed by that blood vessel is now going to die. And so this area is now disrupted. It doesn't have the blood supply, and this would be the, uh, a stroke. This is all gone. Now, I've talked to you briefly before about TPA. So I want you to think what was TPA. And so when we look at this, here we've got the term tissue plasminogen activator. What is going to happen? Tissue plasminogen activator activates plasminogen and what does it become? It becomes plasmin. What does plasmin do? It breaks down a clot. It's called thrombolytic. It breaks the clot down. So this was when I would mentioned to you in class about the door to needle approach. If a person uh, comes, wakes up in the morning and suddenly their arm goes down, they can't really speak that well, uh, and obviously whoever's there with them recognizes that this could be a stroke they're going to phone 911. And once the emergency knows that there's a possible stroke victim coming in, they're ready for them. Right there at emergency, they're going to take them to the CT scan, check to see that it is an ischemic stroke, that it is a clot. And then if they can get this TPA or clot buster into them within half an hour, that is the procedure that they're trying to implement throughout Alberta get that person as quick as possible to have that clot broken down. And so that's what we're seeing with this tissue plasminogen activator, break that down. Now, what if it's a TIA? What does that stand for? And in your notes, you can see this term.
what does transient mean? What does ischemic mean? So transient means if somebody's transient, they come and they go, they're not there long. Ischemic, there's decreased blood flow. So this one is going to be there just for a little while, just like transient would be, just a little while. If a person just for like five minutes or 10 minutes just thinks, I can't even write my name, I, I feel dizzy, I'm not just sure if I can walk. And so these things would be the mini stroke. This is warning that they could have a full stroke. If they recognize that, and 50% of people who've had a stroke have had a mini stroke, if they recognize that and actually get it confirmed, then they could get on um, like a blood thinner or something to prevent the full stroke from occurring. But transient ischemic attack, in your notes you'll see, it doesn't last long, five to 50 minutes. And they'll say that a stroke, it's there for 24 hours. Now, when we look at that, I want you to just recognize hemiplegia. I'll, I'll just draw a stick person quickly. And here we've got this little person, not all that happy. And there. Now, they've had a stroke. And I'm going to put their stroke on this side. So there's the stroke. This is wiped out. And a problem is now on their right side. Which side's going to be affected? And so, as we know, with motor decussation going through the, uh, the medulla, it crosses over. And so now then, it's this side of the body that's going to be affected. And I'll just draw this down. And hemi meaning half. And so half the body, but it's opposite to the stroke side, is going to be affected, hemiplegia. And so that would be that their arm doesn't move. In fact, there's the um, mnemonic that's there for a stroke. And they'll say, people should always be familiar with this. If they think a person's having a stroke, think of this. What does it stand for? And this is for their face. Can they smile? Or is their face looking like one side isn't working? For this one, can they lift that arm? This one, the speech. Is it slurred or can't they make complete sentences? And this one is time. The sooner that they can be diagnosed and get that TPA, the better for them. And so this is what we're seeing as far as strokes. When you look at the term CVA, Cerebral vascular accident. Here's the cerebrum, here's the vascular, and it's blocked off. And that's what we're seeing as far as a stroke. TIA, just a short time. Now for Alzheimer's, if you look on your page um, 81, you can see where Alzheimer's is there. Oh, just before I, I go to Alzheimer's, I need to just tell you about the two types of strokes. There's ischemic stroke, there's hemorrhagic stroke. And in the PowerPoints that I gave to you, then you can see both of them. Which one is this one? This is ischemic. There's the lack of blood flow. What's hemorrhagic? I'm just going to draw a quick uh, aneurysm. So that's what they call a berry aneurysm. Very common in the cerebral arterial circle. But if this breaks and it starts to bleed out, that's a hemorrhagic stroke. 20% of strokes are hemorrhagic. 80% are going to be from ischemia. And so we see the difference. Hemorrhagic, they're, often they'll have just a really severe headache. Um, and then they don't know why, but obviously when it gets diagnosed, then there's a bleed that's going on. And so that's what we're seeing. Uh, how can they take care of this? And in your uh, PowerPoints, you can see pictures I'll just redraw this. If it has a narrow neck, they can put coils in. They can feed that catheter up through the femoral artery, through the, um, through the artery or the aorta up into the brain, and they know just where to go. And once they get there, then they will put coils in to it. I'll just draw some little coils here. And now they've made it so that the pressure of the blood 
isn't as apt to burst this. And so that's if it was a narrow neck. If it had a wide neck, then they can't do that. And so I'm just going to draw one. And here's a wide neck. For a wide necked one, if they recognize that they've got this aneurysm and it's got the potential to burst, then they can go in and put a clip on it. And so you could put something across here and just close it down. Or another thing that they can do in your um, PowerPoint, you'll see, they could put coils in, but then they'll put a stent here so that the coils don't come into the bloodstream. So we've got those. Let's look at Alzheimer's. Very common, and if you've worked in a nursing home, you've been around people with Alzheimer's. Well, how can they detect that they have Alzheimer's? Well, they have a list of things that you'd want to check over, but one of the things that um, will show up, especially on autopsy, would be neurofibrillary tangles. And the other thing, amyloid plaques. I'm just going to draw a quick um, neuron and we're just going to see where are they. And so I'll put this up. Now the neurofibrillary tangles, and as we look at them, I'm going to just put them in here. neurofibrillary tangles. They're disrupting the um, operation of the neuron. But the other thing, as you'll see, um, that the amyloid plaques, they're outside and they're out in here. And so now we've got amyloid plaques. Both of these are making it so that the nerve isn't working well, and that's going to give the uh, signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's. The next one that you've got is Parkinson's disease. We've talked about it before. I just want you right now to think, what is the neurotransmitter that they're de deficient in with Parkinson's? And so when you think, hopefully, you thought of this one, Dopamine. What does dopamine do? Dopamine stops motion. And so if they don't have sufficient dopamine, the tendency is that the fingers keep going or the shuffling keeps going. And we see that. And so I'm just going to turn the page and we'll see the next one on page 82. And for this one, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Now for this one, it's lateral corticospinal tracts. What were corticospinal tracts? Motor or sensory? So when we think corticospinal, I'm just going to put it here. So it's coming from the cortex and it would be in the frontal lobe, it's the motor cortex, it's going to the spinal cord, out to the arms and legs. And this is what's affected with the lateral corticospinal tracts with ALS. Now this was called Lou Gehrig's disease. It's going to um, just be a continual decrease in motor function until eventually the respiratory are affected and then uh, it will be fatal. So we've got that one. Cerebral palsy, I want you to notice that this one is due to a lack of oxygen. It could be just when the baby's born, the cord might be wrapped around and it's not getting sufficient oxygen. It could be just after they're born or shortly thereafter. And then it's going to cause the contractures that are consistent with cerebral palsy. Um, the next one that you've got is anencephaly. And when you look at the term, you can see right away this is no, this is brain. And so with the development of the uh, fetus, the brain uh, didn't develop completely and the, the head is just not as rounded 
And so this is what we see with anencephaly. Uh, spina bifida, we've talked about this in the lab. Uh, I'm just going to do it briefly here. I want you to just recognize that um, if there's one of the um, spinous processes that is missing, then the spinal cord could bulge out. And so we're going to look at this term right here. Now there's the three types. There's the occult, which is hidden. There's no uh, problem from it. Uh, people probably don't even know that it happened. But then there's the meningeal seal, that would be that one. And this would be like the dura mater's bulging, it's the meninges. Seal means a sac, and this would be one of the meninges that we've got. But myelo is the spinal cord. And for this one then, it is actually bulging out of that space where the spinous process never developed. When you think of bifid, uh, spina bifida, it split in two. It never came together and formed um, the top or the, um, the spinous process and this then could bulge out. Uh, with the uh, spinal cord bulging out, it's going to affect a bowel and bladder and walking. And so got those. Um, let's just look at one of the next ones here. Uh, oh, one of the last CNS areas to mature, the hypothalamus. If a baby is born prematurely, they don't have the thermostat regulation. They don't have that temperature control. And so a premature baby has got to be kept warm uh, because it has, doesn't have that control. And so that's what we're seeing with the hypothalamus. Um, the next one, I want you to think of which one of these would happen first in a baby's development. Would they be toilet trained? Would they hold a rattle? Or would they walk? Which one of those would be first? Which would be last? And so we just want to see the order that this would happen. And so, good chance you thought of which one would happen first, and it was that they hold the rattle. What was the next one that they walk? And what was the next one? The toilet training. But why in that order? And it's because myelination occurs from proximal to distal. And so this part would get the myelination first and they'd be able to hold the rattle, do whatever with their hands. But then they don't usually walk until about a year. Toilet training, the myelination for the nerves for the control of the bowel and bladder are not going to get it until two years or so. And so, um, by two or three years, then they will start to be able to toilet train them because the myelination is there. And that's what we see. Um, there's a term in your notes on page 82, reversible dementia. If a person is hypoglycemic, they might not think as correctly as if they had food. Another thing would be if they were on a medication, it could actually make it so that they're not thinking as, as quickly. Uh, uh, blood pressure can affect this as well. So reversible means that it's not obviously uh, due to something happening in the, the brain itself. It's that there's something going on outside. And if they got food and increased the glycemia, then that would be uh, better. Um, for the next one that we've got, atrophy of the brain. I want you to just recognize with Alzheimer's or whatever that it would start to decrease the amount of brain matter that's there. Um, I think we're to the last on this one. And so I'm just going to have you look at the last page on 83. I want you to look at this one for shingles. And so for shingles, if you'll notice on there, it is a viral infection. It's um, from chickenpox. They've laid dormant in the dorsal root ganglion. And now then, it's going to actually come um, alive. It's going to start to express problems, but where does it show the problems? Along a dermatome. And so the dermatome, it could be that it's along a rib and coming around. It would be one location. It could be that it's around the eye. 
But this is getting us to the end of this information, but I did want you to recognize that shingles is this. We've got it unilaterally. It's a viral infection. It's laid dormant from the chicken pox, and we've got that. The last one that we're going to look at here is a myelogram. And if you'll go back to this, myelo meaning spinal cord, and gram is a picture. They put the dye into the uh, CSF, and it now takes a picture. And that completes it for what we've got for nervous system. And then you can go through those.